Now, in the meantime, a pair of polls out yesterday suggest President Trump is the least popular president at the 100-day mark of any since the 1930s. His approval rating in each hovering in the low 40s. That's a little frigid for the weather, but it's really not great news for the president. He has been battling low poll numbers since day one, and he doesn't care. But buried in the political data is an ABC News Washington Post poll. This little chestnut. If the election were held today, the president would still beat Hillary Clinton 43 to 40 percent. That's important because Clinton beat Trump in the popular vote. So what does all of that have to say about why voters still hate Hillary Clinton? Let me bring in my coal-powered party panel tonight. Taya Kyle, founder of the Chris Kyle Frog Foundation and author of American Wife. Get her book today. Robbie Suave is here. He's Reason.com associate editor. And Michael Malice. Observer columnist and author of Dear Reader, the Unauthorized Biography of Kim Jong Il. You heard me right. Uh, welcome back, everyone. Great to have you. Thank you so much for being here. Um, so, Robbie, Hillary Clinton is still losing. So, here's someone who's gone away. She, she's hiked her own rugged Appalachian Trail in Rhode Island, which is difficult to do, but she found a way to do it. She's wearing handsome caftans, and you would think a little time away from the pub public uh, would sweeten the political appetite of voters, but it, it's had the opposite effect. What happened? Right. She's actually losing uh, support, uh, but how do we know those people who are, who are now less favorably inclined toward her, maybe they're just waiting for Chelsea, I think. They're all just ready to vote for Chelsea to be the first, uh, the first Clinton uh, woman president. If that's the case, then people really have given up, and they assume that we're not going to be here in six months. Yeah, well, America's mother-in-law can't win for losing. I mean, she you can't. Saw Katy Perry just came out with a line of pumps inspired by her, and they're so <laughs> hideous, and you can't even walk up the stairs in them without assistance, and it'll give you a stroke if you put them on. I mean, she's deplorable and disgusting. And the fact they're trying to prop up this mummy's daughter, Vandy Fair of all places, that right-wing Republican rag, said hearing things coming out of Chelsea's mouth is like eating oatmeal, oatmeal with a toenail clipping in it. So <laughs> it's really, really sad to watch the sad decline. The most stripped of the pros the there, <laughs> yeah. What the yeah. poll really reveals is that a lot of Americans fall in this middle ground that is yeah. confusing to the media. The media sees everyone as, as, uh, uh, has drunk the Kool-Aid as a Trump person or hates Trump and despises him to mm -hmm. the bottom of their soul. But there's a lot of Americans who are not on board with everything Trump represents but thought he was better than Clinton and they're still kind of, they don't like a lot of it, but he was better than the alternative. And that's their reality, and the media, that doesn't compute for a lot in the media. That's a great point, and uh, Atea, I want to talk about that a little bit, because he may be an unpopular president, mm -hmm. but only 2% of people who voted for him have any remorse about that vote. Mm -hmm. So to Robbie's point, people may not like him, but it's really not about him. It's not about a political personality as much as people are desperate, and they're hoping that this guy has a solution to some of their problems. Yeah, I mean, I think Robbie's point was brilliant, actually, and I think that that is very true, and a lot of people are missing that, that people are not that simple and a lot of us have varying degrees of support and disappointment with whoever's in office and so I think we should kind of stop trusting the polls after the election right I mean yeah. it seems like we use them to make the news not report the news because you can find some polls that are supportive of it some that aren't supportive of it and it depends who you asked how you asked what you asked yeah. and so yeah I think it's 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 interesting to look at it but I don't yeah think and that was the big takeaway from the election is well maybe polls don't mean anything because every single one was wrong all right let's uh, switch it a little bit to the showdown with North Korea seemingly getting worse by the hour by the day this morning President Trump reportedly spoke with the leaders of both China and Japan comes mid word that the communist nation is looking to make another splash possibly by testing another nuclear weapon but now a new twist. North Korea has reportedly arrested an American professor, and that means the North is now holding three U.S. citizens who are essentially hostages of this crazy regime. Uh, Michael Malice, you are our resident North Korea expert. You've spent time in the country, and I know you do a lot of reading and, and talking to colleagues that you've worked with over there. So how does the United States go about getting back these three citizens? Well, the, I mean, this... Is that the, possible? Yeah, of course it's possible, because as you said very correctly, they're hostages. When uh, uh, Laura Ling was there. You know, President Clinton had to go to North Korea, get his ass to Pyongyang, and get on his knee and kiss, you know, kiss Kim Jong Il's ring. So they are reveling in the fact that these people are also treated well. You know, they're not treated poorly because you want your hostage to be returned in pristine conditions. Yeah. They boast about their their even the techniques. kid who was who was um, sentenced to 15 There's years. There's no hard way labor. he's serving hard labor. I don't believe it for a second. Really? And, uh, yes, absolutely not. And and in, and other in, the other point is these people aren't being held arbitrarily. That kid trespassed and stole a port 
portrait. Now, you yeah. trespass in the White House and steal a portrait there. You're not going to be treated well by the Secret Service, of course. But the, everyone who's gotten out of North Korea who's been detained has talked about how they were treated well. And, in fact, the guards use them as a source of information about the outside world because they're clueless about how things work outside North yeah, Korea. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Um, you know, and, and I'll get to you guys in just a little bit. But let's talk about the nuclear showdown because, obviously, this is a very different situation than we've seen in Syria and other countries yes. in the Middle East because uh, North Korea is being very provocative in word and in action. Yes. Is the United States justified in, in talking about defense? Well, I'm going to make a little correction to what you said in the intro. They no longer identify as, as communist. In fact, under Kim Jong-il's philosophy of Sungun, it means military first. Okay. So they are a military first country, and they think that the only way, they correctly think, the only way they survive is through the military. Mm -hmm. So as we're escalating, this is a brinksmanship that we haven't seen since the Bay of Pigs under the Kennedy administration. In that case, it was the U.S. versus Cuba and the Soviet Union. But here, bizarrely, it's the U.S. and the other communist superpower, China, against the little country who's got the nukes, who's basically reveling in giving the fix was, to the was big Was Cuba boys. as crazy, though? I mean, it there, seems there's, there's, there's a Korea, level of instability The fact that here. North Korea has been around longer than the Soviet Union shows that they actually are stable. And if they're being crazy, they're being really bad at it because yeah. they're making everybody else crazy and dance to the tune of their drum. All right. So does that tune change? Um, is this there is unprecedented. Okay. We have never seen anything like this escalation between the U.S. and North Korea in North Korea's history. Uh, in your gut, how does it end? I'm freaking out. Okay. But I would still, uh, there are three things we can do basically. We could economic sanctions, military might, or diplomacy. And I, I mean, it's pretty obvious the only one of those we really want to engage in is probably diplomacy. I, yeah. I'm skeptical that economic sanctions would help a situation where most of the people are starving anyway and, and isola they're isolated from the rest of the world. So what does sanctions accomplish there? So we should, you know, talk to the regime and try to get our hostages home, preferably on a plane flight that's yeah. not united. And, and since we don't have a diplomatic relationship with North Korea, we have to talk through... Sweden. What other message should we be spending through or sending rather through the Swedes? Well, I mean, I think the, the first thing is you talk about brinksmanship, that is North Korea, right? They're going to continue to push the line until we fight back. Yeah. And so I, I, I don't know, it seems reasonable to me that they throw up this failed missile attack and they go, oh, that didn't work, take a hostage because this is embarrassing and we need to get our power back. I could be wrong, but it just seems like for somebody who's trying to show power to have failed that badly, now they need to do something else. And I don't think that we should negotiate with them because we've never negotiated with terrorists. And I don't think that that's the way that we need to handle North Korea because that's what they want. They're like the little kid or the bully on the playground who yeah. thinks, if I amp it up, eventually they're going to answer to me. And yep. so then we teach them, if you amp it up enough, take more hostages, eventually you get a response from us. We have 10 seconds well, left. Well, that's the theory that the missile test was failed on purpose to, so that they're backing down without backing down.